Is the mic on the whole time? I'd like to call the meeting to order, and we do have a quorum of the regents, so good morning. Uh, I, I want to start by thanking our host, Dr. Satchel. Um, thank you for hosting us, and uh, since we're in this academic space area, I will give you an A+. Plus. A plus for, for the student engagement last night, which was phenomenal. A plus on the food last night and today. And A plus for keeping your seat <laughs> um, Chancellor Perman and I just finished presenting the Regents Faculty Award. At each spring meeting, we recognize recipients of the Board of Regents Faculty Awards. These faculty awards are the highest honor presented by the board to exemplary faculty members within the university system of Maryland. These awards recognize distinguished performance for research, scholarship or creative activity, public service, <laughs> mentoring, teaching and innovation. The recipients were nominated by their faculty peers at each institution and recommended by their presidents for selection by the board and chancellor. This distinguished group reflects the best of our faculty, having had outstanding impact on the students they teach and mentor, advancing knowledge and creativity in their respective disciplines, and impacting communities they serve. It was such a pleasure to honor these faculty earlier this morning with a breakfast. I'd like to recognize them at this time. I will ask that you hold your applause until the entire group is presented. When I call your name, please stand. In the category of Research, Scholarship, Creative Activity, Professor Bob Bartlett. He had to leave to teach a class. Okay. <laughs> we like to hear that. Dr. Brian Foth, Dr. Margelina Connors, Dr. Ting Lee, in the category of public service, Dr. David Marcosi, Dr. Sabrina uh, Fu, Dr. Danita Tolson, and Dr. Jan Williams. In the category of mentoring, Dr. Loretta Bayou, Dr. Gregory Carey, Dr. Miriam Purnell, and Dr. Petra Suju. In the category of teaching, Dr. Emily Bailey, Dr. Lee Laney, Dr. Jenica Larison, and Dr. Celeste McCarty. And in the category of innovation, Dr. Joseph Scalia. Please give them a round of applause. Congratulations again, and you are all welcome to stay or free to leave <laughs> at your leisure. Go work. <laughs> A lot has happened since we last met. This is the first meeting since Valerie Shears Ashby was named as the next president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Dr. Ashby is an impressive scholar and dynamic leader. I look forward to her leadership at UMBC, building on its strong foundation of excellence and accomplishment in teaching and research. I thank UMBC president, the presidential search committee chaired by Regent Michelle Gordine for finding such a distinguished leader among many other candidates. And of course, once again, I thank President Freeman Rabowski for his 30 years of transformational leadership at UMBC. <laughs> There's one more president search in progress. The Salisbury University Presidential Search Committee is moving toward its conclusion. As this search closes, I want to thank 
the Salisbury Presidential Search Committee chaired by Regent Robert Rao. I also want to thank President White for his leadership of Salisbury. There have been other key events as well. While not an appointment, I did want to note that last month, Chancellor Perman and I had the pleasure of inaugurating Dr. Gregory Fowler as the seventh president in the University of Maryland Global Camp Campus, and he's already making his mark at UMGC. University of Maryland Baltimore President Bruce Gerald has appointed leading heart vascular and lung physician scientist Dr. Mark Gladwin as the new dean of the University of Maryland School of Medicine effective August 1st. And Governor Hogan appointed UMBC's uh, Farah Hillel to the USM Board of Regents she will begin her two-year term as student region, the non-voting member, on July 1st. And finally, um, but certainly not less important, Deanna Johnson, who has served as a member of this USM Board of Regents since 2016, is leaving the Board of Regents. I would like to thank Deanna for her service and her friendship over these past years. Let's give Deanna a round of applause. Before we hear Chancellor Perman's report to the board, Townsend University President Kim Satchel will share some news with us. Then um, Joshi, the director of the University of Maryland Council, Counseling Center, will lead our educational forum on the issue of collegiate mental health. President Satchel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Gooden, Chancellor Perman, and members of the Board of Regents. Welcome to our beautiful new University Union here in the center of the Student Life District at Towson University. This new space is at the core of our campus is an extension of our original University Union building. The remodeling of the original space will be completed later this summer, bringing more than 225,000 square feet of space online for our students to meet, eat, and connect with each other. The original University Union was built in the 1970s when our student population was just under 9,000 students. Today, more than 20,000 students walk through these doors each and every day on their way to class. Through TU's campus master plan that was approved by the regents last fall, we have six distinct districts coming to life and providing a strategic roadmap to Towson University's future. From our residential spaces, to our athletic facilities, from our research labs, to academic classrooms. From this union and the Rec IM field that's just outside, to the downtown Towson University Business District campus. As you drove into the campus this morning, you probably saw the cranes on the north side of campus, and there's nothing that warms a president's heart more than the cranes. <laughs> Last summer, we broke ground on our College of Health Professions building, which will, as the largest provider of healthcare professionals in the state, provide for the very first time the opportunity to house TU's 28 health professions degree programs under one roof and support interprofessional education for all of our students. These are just some of the projects underway or recently completed on campus that support the realization of the campus master plan, which for the next decade will provide a roadmap for the university in support of our goal to attain R2 Carnegie classification high research activity. On behalf of the entire community, we really appreciate the support and confidence of the board, as well as the chancellor, for these much needed capital projects to replace aged obsolete facilities that were built over 50 years ago and added capacity to support the university's growth 
during those five decades. These goals are also supported through the RISE campaign. It's our comprehensive campaign for Towson University, which had its public launch a year ago this very week. One year later, with a campaign goal of $100 million, I am pleased and proud to say that we are at 84% of that goal. And speaking a little bit more about TU's growing culture of philanthropy, when we host the Board of Regents meetings on our campuses, given this opportunity, my colleague presidents often showcase the research and work of faculty and staff or the achievements and talents of their students. Well, at TU, we have stories of excellence and achievement in these areas as well, but I decided to highlight a very unique partnership, or should I say a joint venture between the TU Foundation and the university that has led to tremendous impact on our campus community. Launched in 2008, the TU Foundation Grant Program has awarded over $400,000 to over 30 grant requests in support of faculty research, community wow. engagement, and student success initiatives, just to name a few areas of focus. The grant program, which emulates micro grant funding you see in verticals often outside of higher education, provides seed capital to those initiatives to establish viability and spark the evolution of innovation and ideas. These micro grants are a highly cost effective infusion of funding that enables faculty and staff to move projects from the sides of their desks to a more prominent position in their work and research portfolios and ultimately is intended to support the maturation of these projects so they are well positioned to succeed in getting external funding. I would like to introduce Brian DeFilippis, TU's Vice President of Advancement, to tell you more about this very exciting joint venture that we have with the TU Foundation. Brian? Good morning. Thank you for allowing us to showcase the TU Foundation Grant Program. As the President mentioned several years ago, the Towson University Foundation embarked on an effort to better align with and support the goals and objectives of the university. The Foundation's primary focus for nearly 50 years has been student scholarships, an important and laudable and impactful area of support. But as the university's goals and objectives expanded, there was a need to broaden the support provided by the TU Foundation. To that end, the foundation started focusing on student success, research, and community partnerships, all natural places to direct additional support. With an expanded focus, the TU Foundation created the grant program to advance the university's strategic plan, support outstanding faculty and staff-led projects, provide funding for emerging initiatives that can be scaled with additional support, and support research engagement opportunities that enrich student experiences. The program was also meant to provide foundation directors with opportunities to interact with students, faculty, and staff, and surface projects that advance the university's strategic plan and demonstrate the university's impact. Four years into the grant program, I'm pleased to report that the grant program has been a tremendous success. The foundation has supported programs that enhance students' experiences in myriad ways, including living learning communities, faculty and staff, and student research collaborations. And the grants have also extended to use reach into surrounding communities, advancing work with underserved, vulnerable, and at-risk populations. And there have been two other important outcomes. Foundation directors have become more deeply involved with a number of the projects and the university and they have personally invested in specific projects via their own philanthropy. Finally, the grant program has allowed faculty and staff to receive valuable feedback and support that has enhanced their projects and resulted in external funding opportunities. Projects that were funded by the TU Foundation have sought and received external funding to extend and expand their work. Even projects that were not funded went on to secure external funding support with collaboration with our university advancement staff. One faculty member who submitted a project proposal for $25,000 last fall has since refined their project proposal and is submitting a request for $500,000 from a major national foundation this spring. 
This has been a very rewarding initiative for everyone involved and continues to advance the important work of TU students, faculty, and staff. The program has also received attention from other universities and foundations that have learned about our grant program and are looking to emulate our work. There is perhaps no better way to showcase the TUF grant program than to have you here directly from two of our faculty members who received a grant this past winter. Dr. Natalie Scala, Associate Professor and Graduate Program Director in the College of Business and Economics, and jo Dr. Josh Dellinger, Professor and Computer Science Program Director, applied for and received funding for their work related to election security, a topic of great importance to all of us. Their research has involved undergraduate and graduate students and has been published in top academic journals. They have received national and international media coverage for their work, and they have been recognized by multiple awards, including one from the University System of Maryland Board of Regents and the Election Assistance Commission Clearinghouse Award. I would like to, I'd like to invite Dr. Scala and Dellinger to come forward and briefly share their work with you this morning. Good morning. Uh, we'd like to thank the Towson University Foundation, Towson University, President Schatzel, Vice President DeFilippis, and the BTU Initiative, School of Emerging Technologies, for supporting this project and believing in this work from day one. As Brian mentioned, my name is Josh Dalinger. I'm a professor in the Department of Computer Information Sciences. And my collaborator, Dr. Natalie Scala, is an associate professor in the College of Business and Economics. And together, we are the co-directors and principal investigators of the Empowering Secure Elections Research Lab here at Towson University. As Brian mentioned, we are also both USM Board of Regents award winners during the COVID area. So this is a, a nice opportunity to thank the Board of Regents in person. <laughs> All right, so really, what is the topic of our research and why are we here? So election security obviously has been on everyone's mind and it's been a hot topic of discussion since really the 2016 general election. And some of these discussions can be really polarizing. There's a lot of politics involved, but our lab, ESE or Empowering Secure Elections takes a nonpartisan data-driven approach. And if you really strip the politics out of the discourse for a second and you think about what happened in 2020, there are some legitimate research questions. You know, we scaled up to mail voting essentially overnight. Ohio canceled their primary election in person the night before the election and moved to um, extended absentee. Michigan had issues with poll workers dropping out due to pneumonia, like three weeks before the first official COVID case was um, identified in the state. So there's some legitimate research questions associated with how COVID potentially could have affected our election processes and our election security. And there's also questions associated with polling places. And this is where the public interacts with the process. They vote at a polling place. And we want them to feel confident in their vote and make sure that it's accounted as it's cast. And for the public, I think a lot of the discourse that we see in the media, they might feel like it's political or esoteric or doesn't really involve them, but really it does because again, they're voting. So we want to ensure that votes are counted as they're cast. And as a supply chain researcher, I think of it as the supply chain of votes. From the moment it's cast to the moment it's counted, we don't want anything to happen to it. We want that vote to be counted the way it is. So most of the research in elections focuses at cybersecurity, and it's typically at the state level, meaning we're looking at what happens with the servers and the overall vote counting process. Polling places are neglected, typically in academic research. Mail voting is typically neglected. But this is how Americans vote, and this is their experience with the voting process. So polling places are managed by counties. And in our separation of powers, obviously states are in charge of managing the actual elections. And polling places funded by um, the states come through that funding comes down, right? So the state gets an allocation for elections. It flows to counties, it flows to various localities. And one of the challenges with that is that by the time it gets to various counties, really what's left is administering the election itself. You know, funding the polling place, having the pallets printed, having the equipment in place. We don't really have a lot of funding historically for these larger questions about cybersecurity, election security, things like that. So this is why we're so grateful for the TU Foundation work, because to get started in this area and to get that traction 
it was hard for us to find initial funding at the state level, at the locality level. And using this initial seed funding has helped us to bring out, um, bring awareness, excuse me, to the project and hopefully um, continue to get more external funding. We are the first academic team to define elections as a systemic interplay of threats. So that's an influence diagram, it's a little bit detailed, but really, like I mentioned a second ago, most academic re research sits in cybersecurity. We believe that fundamentally threats can be cyber, they could be physical, we could you know, drop a flash drive and a cup of coffee, for example, and lose votes. They could be insiders. Um, most of the time, you know, all our poll workers are extremely altruistic. They're here because they want to be part of the process, but they might make an honest mistake, and that could also bring in risk to the process. And what we found is that a lot of times risk shifts. So if, for example, a state wants to remove um, a, a cybersecurity component from the voting county machine so the votes are counted offline, well, now they're on flash drives. And like I said, it could be dropped in a cup of coffee, it could fall out of an envelope on the way to the port of elections. Things could happen, risk shifts around. So it really is a systemic interplay. So again, we were the first team to actually define it that way. And our research and our literature and other researchers have cited that work and built from it. We are also the first academic team to assess risk in elections. So we have used data from the Elections Assistance Commission to identify where are relative likelihood of threats? What are the most important threats we should be watching? Because again, if we have limited funding at polling places and at localities, they can't potentially pay attention to everything. So what are those highest threats or those most important things that we should look at? Some of the outcomes of our work um, identified that the dramatic scale up of mail voting during COVID-19 did not necessarily increase threat to the process. Mail voting dis. <laughs> eyes as an adversary. It doesn't want foreign nationals and foreign other types of adversaries may not want to engage in the process. It also increases voter participation. Those are two really big wins for democracy, right? More people voting and less foreign interference. So our goals are to continue performing risk assessments, not only in mail voting, but to look at other types of voting equipment and other um, polling type equipment and what happens at polling places as well. So real quickly, what about our poll workers? Um, they are our first line of defense in election security. They historically do not receive training in election security. The training that they receive focuses on equipment usage and what could happen and what is how to actually make that equipment work. Sometimes that training happens months before an election. So our intervention was to create these training modules, and here's a screenshot on the slides, for poll workers to be able to identify potential threats that may emerge and then actually mitigate them. You know, our research, we don't have evidence that these threats actually ever happened at a polling place, but we don't want them to become reality. So we want poll workers to be able to identify them and respond to them. We partnered primarily with Anne Arundel County, also with Hartford County. Our, trailing, our training was available to 1,900 poll workers in Anne Arundel County before the 2020 general election. These training modules that are online take about 20 minutes to complete. They are backed by academic testing, research from and structural design and educational pedagogy from TU Cyber for All project. And that project, Cyber for All, has been funded by the National Science Foundation and the National Security Agency. Um, we, our work has also been supported by a study that shows that the knowledge of threat for poll workers increases after interacting with our training. That increase is statistically significant, so it's not by chance. They learn about threat, they learn how to mitigate by having this interaction with the training. And our focus on local board of election solutions is so unique, at least to academia, but still so critical to our national infrastructure. We are very proud of our successes that wouldn't have been possible through the found funding through TU Foundation and other Towson University uh, programs. This is not work just by Natalie and I. This did involve uh, almost 20 undergraduate and graduate students from almost every college at TU who made meaningful, authentic research contributions to this project. This included both TU students as well as ACES students from University of College Park. This has allowed us to have ongoing partnerships with Anne Arundel and Hartford County Board of Elections. The work has, this, uh, has uh, received both local national and international uh, media attention from the Baltimore Sun, from Newsweek, Yahoo Finance, 
and just a few weeks ago from uh, French media uh, prior to their elections as well. It's resulted in a number of publications and journals and conferences. We've met with congressional staffers who are interested in election security and we can, we've provided them our results. Uh, as uh, Natalie mentioned, we uh, earned the 2020 US uh, Election Assistant Committee Commission Clearinghouse Award. Natalie gave the keynote address at the NATO Conference on Operations Research and Analysis. There is so much more we could talk about this work. We do know our time is short, so anyone who is interested, we do have a leave behind of all the contributions, other things that are, we are doing in this project. If we, uh, if any questions there, we'd be happy to talk about it. Please contact us. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you for that excellent presentation. Do we have any questions for the presenters from the uh, from the board or the president? So are you asking for more money? <laughs> <laughs> Always ask for more oh, money. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, then, um, we will continue. Um, I was very happy to see this morning uh, someone join us for the Board of Regents. Um, if we had a category called Region Emeritus that was awarded on service, dedication, professionalism, and self-sacrifice, it would have gone to Barry uh, Gossett. And Barry's with us this morning. Hey. Next, we want to welcome uh, Dr. Joshi, who is the director of the University Counseling Center at the University of Maryland College Park. Dr. Joshi has extensive counseling psychological experience in higher education settings. Prior to his time at College Park, Dr. Joshi worked at the University of Connecticut and Franklin and Marshall College. Dr. Joshi will be speaking to us today about collegiate mental health and current trends and innovations in the field. Welcome, Dr. Joshi. All right, so uh, before I begin my presentation, um, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, just take a moment to thank uh, the Board of Regents, Chancellor, um, you know, Dr. Bowman, Dr. Lee, uh, you know, Denise and uh, Kelsey for all of this, uh, all of their help in kind of setting this up, and Dr. Pines and uh, Dr. Perillo at uh, University of Maryland College Park uh, for giving me this opportunity to present about this very important topic to you. So, uh, what I'm going to present about today <coughs> is uh, collegiate mental health trends and innovations. Um, and uh, if you go to the next slide, the topics that I'm going to cover are basically looking at match. Again, I'm not, you know, what I'm focusing on in this presentation to try and give you a good summary is national collegiate mental health trends over the last 10 or 15 years, right? Uh, I'm going to talk about that because what has happened over the last 10, 15 years is going to inform us, you know, going forward. Uh, I'm also going to focus a little bit on national collegiate mental health trends that have developed during the pandemic. And as you can imagine, this is something that is still developing, right? The actual impact, the actual impact on the mental health of students uh, across our campuses as a result of the pandemic is there's, there's large parts of it that is still unknown, but there is some new information that is coming out that is important to look at and plan for accordingly. So I'm going to focus a little bit on that. Uh, and then uh, I'm also going to focus on uh, innovations that college, college counseling centers across the nation are engaging in to try and address all of these different trends that have developed over the last 20 years, that have developed during the pandemic. You know, I am, you know, I sit on a, on a monthly meeting with a lot of different directors within the USM system. And even within the USM system, there is so much innovation, there is so much excellent work being that, that's going on. Uh, that is, it's really mind blowing to think about that. Uh, so the first question before I even begin exploring the trends is really, do colleges and universities have a responsibility for, to care for student mental health and well-being? So that's a really important question. And from my perspective, there are really two answers, two types of answers to this question. 
One is more of a philosophical um, uh, answer, uh, answer to the question. Uh, and the second is more of a financial answer to the question. So as far as the philosophical answer to the question goes, you know, we as universities across the nation, USM, are known for working with students and really caring and tending to the life of their minds uh, so that, you know, we educate them, get them to a place where they become contributing um, members of our society. And that's a huge focus for us, right? But they can only do that if everything related, if, if their well-being is well in place, right? We, they can only do that if we can also care for their hearts to ensure that they are in a place that allows them to then contribute for, a, that allows them to fully participate in all of the educational opportunities that we offer them. So from a philosophical perspective, I strongly believe that we do have, uh, have as colleges, as university, we do have an important responsibility to not only care for the minds of our students, but also care for their hearts to ensure that their overall well-being is where it needs to be so that they can go on to bigger and better things, learn a lot of things while they're at the university and go on to bigger and better things to become productive members of the society going forward. The financial uh, reasons for this is there's a lot of research actually that's out there, you know, that's out there looking at uh, the importance of mental wellness, mental health, well-being, uh, and uh, student success. Uh, I'll cite a couple of research uh, uh, findings. Uh, the Active Minds Network uh, recently ran a survey, and they've been doing that over multiple years, and uh, of college students across the nation. And what they found was that college students who struggle with mental health issues are twice as likely than students who don't have struggle with mental health issues to actually drop out. Right? And that's now national. The counseling center at the University of Maryland has been running what we call as a student census survey for the last 55 years. We survey all incoming first year students about a lot of different topics, including their mental health. During the pandemic over the last two years, what that survey showed us was 32% of the students who responded to the survey, and the N is pretty big, it's about 4,000 students, so a large part of the group that's of incoming students. 32% of those students said that they were likely to drop out of the university as a result of the mental health, uh, as a result of the mental health issues that they were experiencing that was caused by the pandemic, right? So again, all of these things have a tremendous impact on uh, retention. All of these th things have a tremendous impact on the financial health of our system. So uh, to summarize, both of those are important reasons as to why we need to focus on why this issue is really, really important. So before I kind of move forward and talk about all of the different uh, trends in collegiate mental health over the last 20 years and during the pandemic, I want to make an important distinction over here. And the distinction is what do I actually mean by mental health when I'm talking about mental health in this presentation? So all of us have mental health. All of us during our lives are impacted by various factors that, you know, by, by various events in our lives, uh, social political events, personal events, what have you. They cause stress, what have you. So, you know, there's a whole continuum. When we talk about mental health issues, there's a whole continuum of them, right? It's those that kind of stress stuff that exists for all of us. But then we also have students who struggle with clinically diagnosable depression, clinically diagnosable anxiety, panic attacks, trauma-related issues, etc., etc. So for the purposes of this presentation, what I'm going to be focusing is on the latter, which is basically more on the clinical side rather than the general stress side. Now, I'm, under no circumstances am I trying to say over here that this first part is less important. All of this is important, right? Because not only is it important to treat people who are truly struggling with diagnosable conditions, but it's also important to set up systems that allow us to build resilience in our students so that they can fare well and so that when they are stressed out or when they are challenged in their lives, they have the skills necessary to bounce back from the challenge and continue on the track that they are on. Right. So, but remember, for this presentation, as I present this data, I'm focusing on the more clinical side. Uh, another thing to add over here is I read a lot of different things when it comes to collegiate mental health. Uh, one of the source of information of research that I trust the most is this uh, research that's coming out of the Center for Collegiate Mental Health, which is an institution that's based mm -hmm. in Penn State. Uh, the reason I look up to the research that comes out of that institution is it is actually research based upon students who actually come to the counseling centers across counseling centers across the nation. So there's about 200 to 300 counseling centers that contribute data to CCMH, Center for Collegiate Mental Health, 
and the information that's contributed is not only about what students are saying as they come and enter the clinical system, but it also has information about what the clinician's assessments are of what the student is presenting with. So it's really good solid data that we can use to kind of make some, get a good understanding of what students are struggling with. So uh, as I mentioned before, what I'm going to focus on first is just what has the last 20 years for our student when it comes to collegiate mental, when it comes to their mental health. There are some pretty significant trends that have emerged. First and foremost, and I think this is not going to be a surprise to anyone in this room, uh, is that the demand for services has consistently, for mental health services in counseling centers has consistently gone up over the last two decades. Uh, this data represents uh, from about 2009 to 2018 or so. Uh, but really, the demand for services across counseling centers in the nation has gone up back to about 40%, right? But at the same time, the enrollment in universities and colleges has gone up by about 5%, right? So it's not as if there's more students coming into universities. Yes, there are. But there's also the fact that students who are actually coming in are requiring additional services, additional mental health services. So the demand for services has consistently increased. The second important trend across the nation, again, uh, is that the severity of clinical presentation as students come into the our clinical system has increased. So there are more students who had previous contact with psychiatrists, who have been medicated, who have uh, perhaps been hospitalized before, uh, who have had significant suicidal ideation. So more severe clinical presentation is also a very important trend that has developed uh, that we have seen over the last 20 years. And the important thing to note over here is that these students they're not the full proportion of students coming into the counseling centers. They represent a certain proportion, you know, not a big proportion, but still a significant proportion. These small proportion of students or this group of students accounts for about 20 or 30 percent of the use of the counseling center services, right? So they use up a lot of services, uh, you know, as compared to all of the rest of the students who enter a clinical system. So those two are some of the most important trends that have developed in collegiate mental health over the last 20 years. The other important trend over here, and this has been something that's concerning, you know, concerning me, this is something that keeps me awake at night, and I know that this does for all of us who are, you know, plugged into the mental health field, uh, is just the increase in the number of students dealing with self-threat indicators. And what I mean by that is that students who are reporting that they've had suicidal ideation before, or students who are reporting that they've been hospitalized for suicidal ideation before, or they have thoughts of suicide when they're dealing with stress or what have you, right? And this is a very concerning thing. So uh, that's something that's been on the rise over the last 20 years. Another important trend over here that I want to also point out is increasingly so, students are consistently telling us, you know, I'm really glad that we have a counseling center. I'm really glad that you're able to provide individual group therapy. I'm really glad that I'm able to plug into that service maybe in a couple of weeks. But I am struggling with something just now. Is there anything that you can do to help me just now as I deal with the distress that I'm experiencing in the moment? Um, and in response to that, what counseling centers across the nation have started to do is to divide more, is to um, uh, devote more and more uh, clinical and financial resources to establishment of treatment modalities that allow for that rapid access to treatment. Right. So the general individual therapy group therapy, very important that is ongoing. But in addition to that, people have also started to focus on what are ways in which we can also increase resources towards more rapid access treatment modalities. The last trend over here that I want to point out before I move on to talking about the pandemic is, you know, over the last 20 years, we've done a fabulous job counseling centers across the nation within our U.S. system, reaching out to students, encouraging them, encouraging them to seek help when they need it, and students have started to come. But what is also very clear is that our minoritized students on our campuses who have prevalence of mental health issues, which is about, you know, kind of about the same as uh, their white counterpart, are less likely still to come into the counseling center and seek the help that they need, right? So there's disparities over there that we need to clearly look at and need to figure out a plan or strategize in order to ensure that our minoritized students are also able to come in and get the help and the support that they need so that they can become successful students and won't move on to bigger and better things as they graduate from our universities. Okay, so um, these are important trends. 
these are pretty striking trends over here. Like I said, they represent about 20 years of research uh, uh, in collegiate mental health. And so the next question naturally that comes up is like, what is causing these trends, right? And this question is a difficult question to answer. It's a multifaceted, it's a complex question to answer. There is research that's out there that is starting to emerge that kind of speaks to this. But I would say, I would be lying if I were to say that there is one-on-one -on -one causality that I can clearly say to you that X cause Y over here, right? It's a complex interplay of things that we've lived through <coughs> as a nation over the last 20 years that's causing some of the things that we are seeing. First and foremost, there's a couple, couple of things that I want to uh, you know, highlight are actually the points that are at the bottom. Over the last 20 years, more so than ever before in our culture, there has been an increased awareness of the impact of mental, uh, of mental health and the impact of not having good mental health on our functioning, that there's an increasing awareness, right? And that has definitely led to a greater number of students needing the help, you know, understanding that they're not doing well and then seeking out help when they need to. The science of diagnosing mental health issues uh, is continues to improve. We are not, I would, I would be lying if I were to say that, you know, it's, it's completely there. There's a lot of progress still to be made, but it's gotten better over the years. Uh, and that has also then led us to uh, diagnose people and to be able to provide them the treatment that they need more effectively. And that's also one of the reasons that we are seeing greater demand for services. People are more aware, there's better ability to diagnose and test for things that then causes better, more people to kind of seek treatment as well. In general, and this is actually laudable, is that, you know, more students, more so than ever before, now have access to higher education than in the past. Uh, you know, uh, probably due to financial reasons, due to various important laws such as the Americans with Disability Act, all of those things contribute to more number of students having access. And then they, it also represents a large number of students who have, you know, who may have mental health issues that they've struggled with that, that are now coming into our, uh, our university systems, right? So that's, those are three important reasons why I believe, uh, that, I, that I believe are contributing to these trends. But then you also look at the last 20 years, the last 20 years haven't been an easy 20 years for our country, for our culture. You know, we started with 2001 when we had the, you know, uh, terrorist attacks. Then in 2008, our country had lived through some pretty significant recession, you know, financial issues. We had students whose families were struggling with financial issues uh, and the anxiety that it caused. Uh, look at the last two years, right? forget about the last two years, think about what had, you know, there's so much social political unrest, there's so much racism related concerns, the white nationalism related concerns that have grown in this country over the last four or five years that impact a lot, all of us, but especially our minoritized students. Um, and then you look at the last two years, right? It's the pandemic and it has had a significant impact on all of us. And then we come into 2021, trying to put the pandemic behind, and then we have the Ukraine war, right? So last 20 years have been difficult. And for all of us, it remains with us. It impacts how we think, it impacts how we feel, it impacts how we interact with our world, and it impacts our mental health, uh, mental health overall. So I would say, if I were to conjecture based upon research and based upon my reading, those would be some of the things that are contributing the, to the current trends. Uh, and my, uh, you know, my, my projection over here is that, uh, you know, this is going to be, we're going to continue to see these trends continue to increase uh, over the next, you know, over, at least over the next decade or so, uh, unless we take some good action to try and, uh, you know, address some of these concerns. Okay. Uh, so I know that there's a lot of interest now in how has the pandemic impacted collegiate mental health, college student mental health. Um, and there's a lot of articles out in the media that talk about the mental health crisis, the mental health crisis. And, you know, it is important to understand what that actually means, right? Because the more we understand what it means, the better we are able to plan for things, the better we are able to strategize for things, and the better actions we are able to take to try and address the things that we are thinking will come in through our clinical systems as you know, as, as we deal the, with the after effect of the pandemic. So that's why it's important to understand what is the nuance over here? Yes, the mental health crisis, but what is actually the nuance over here that we need to actually pay attention to is really, really important. <laughs> so what we found across college counseling centers, and this is actually not something that's on the slide over there. It was interesting to see that during the pandemic, 2020, 2021, the number of students, especially 2020, seeking out mental health services, contrary to our expectations, actually decreased 
at the counseling centers. Remember, I'm talking about research about students who are coming into the counseling center, right? But there's a very clear explanation. Most of the students were back in their home communities and most, and because of complex state laws that prevent us from functioning across state lines, uh, most students were seeking help in their communities. So the number of students coming into the counseling centers was reduced. Now, what we have seen since then in 2021 is that the rate of service utilization in our counseling centers is starting to go up. We are about three or 4% below pre-pandemic levels and all counseling centers directors across the nation expect that we will go beyond pre-pandemic levels in the fall or early spring and then stay up from there on. So that's basically the kind of overall utilization trend that we're noticing. What we also find as a result of the pandemic is a general increase in malaise, a general increase in students struggling with depression as they come into the counseling centers, increased anxiety, but there are two things that really stand out that are striking as to what students are struggling with the most. The biggest thing that consistently in 2021 and 2020, in 2020 and 2021, that stu students struggled with the most was academic distress. Students consistently across all of the research that was done talked about, about uh, struggling to concentrate. Students talked about being in a remote learning environment and having to care for their siblings and that being impactful or students talked about how it was really difficult to even manage the academic month. So academic, academic distress was one of the things that students struggled the most with during the pandemic. The other thing that students also struggled with more than in the pre-pandemic levels was family distress, right? And you can understand why, right? Most students during the remote learning period went back home. They're used to being on our campuses. They're used to having their independence and making their own rules and stuff like that. But then going back home, having to readjust to being in the family environment was really, really difficult for our students. So there was a lot of family distress as well. More students over the pandemic. And again, remember, these are just initial emerging trends. There is a lot more stuff to come out of the pandemic and its impact on our mental health of our students in the years to come. But more students have, you know, as they enter the clinical system, have talked about experiencing trauma than before. More students have talked about experiencing sexual assault. Uh, more students have talked about experiencing harassing, controlling behavior. And the biggest, another important trend, which goes back to the larger trend over the last 20 years, is that the pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on the mental health of our minoritized students, right? I mean, you already have the initial trend where our minoritized students uh, don't access care as much as they want to or they need to. And then on top of that, you add in the pandemic. And so the impact of the pandemic on our minoritized students has been greater. Uh, and that's just one of the reasons. There's other reasons, you know, racism, what have you. There's a bunch of other reasons that have contributed to that unfortunate uh, trend over there. All right. So those were uh, some trends over the last 20 years. Those are some trends over the last two years from the pandemic. Again, like I said, uh, when it comes to the pandemic, there's a lot more that we need to learn and find out. But in response to all of these trends, counseling centers across the nation, counseling centers across the USM system, uh, and I meet with all of the directors on a monthly basis, you know, thanks to Dr. Bowman and Dr. Warren Kelly. Uh, they're doing fabulous things to try and address these various trends. Uh, one of the biggest and the most important things that we have done at the University of Maryland College Park and I see happening across the field is a real mindful conversation across all levels of the leadership. So I'm talking about my conversation with Dr. Patty Perillo, Dr. Warren Kelly, who are uh, who's the Vice President of Student Affairs and also Senior Associate Vice President, conversation with Dr. Pines about what kind of services do we really want to offer to our students? And then based upon that agreement, uh, deciding, okay, how to go about staffing for those services and how to go about implementing that service. So that's a conversation that's already starting across counseling centers across the nation, across USM, definitely at the University of Maryland College Park. That has led to additional funding, that has led to increased uh, you know, expansion of our services. So that's an important, so be, being aligned across all levels of leadership to ensure that we have a clear understanding of the kind of services we want to provide students and how to set them up is really, really important. That's happening a lot. The second thing that's also happening, and this goes back to a point that I made earlier, is that more and more universities, counseling centers, and various directors overseeing these various areas are starting to look at how can we set up systems of care 
that span the entire continuum from wellness all the way to treatment right so i talked about students being stressed out right and there are things that we need to be doing in order to help those students as well but then we also have students who are actually studying depression and we need to be able to provide them treatment as well so more and more so across the nation i see counseling centers trying to set up systems that span that entire continuum and that's really really critical people are starting to use various approaches to setting up clinical systems such as a flexible care approach does a therapy session really need to be 50 minutes uh, you know, if it's a very singular issue, then maybe it's a 20, 30 minute session and you're done. Uh, you know, does there, does there need to be an intake assessment? There's a lot of different things that have been held as kind of the things that absolutely need to happen that are being questioned and changed uh, as a result of some of these various models that counseling centers across the nation are using. People are using step care approaches, and this is something that we are trying to set up at the University of Maryland College Park as well, where as students come, in, come into our clinical system, we'll assess them and we will connect them to the most treatment effective most effective treatment and get the least resource intensive treatment first if student needs something more we can connect them to additional resources so there's a lot of mindful approaches that are being taken into consideration to try and address these various threats hybrid services are here to say if you had asked me in january 2020 do you think online services are good for students i would have said oh you know i don't know you know i, I don't know if it's as effective as in-person <laughs> therapy well over the last two years, we have found out that it's as effective and it's actually <laughs> increases access and increases flexibility. And that's here to stay. And that's a very positive thing. Talk about learning from something that's that has been as negative as the pandemic. And then there's a lot of teleservices companies out there uh, that are now uh, that where counseling centers are now partnering with those teleservices companies uh, to add in to their existing resources. Uh, you know, there's mental health apps. Uh, that's that you know that that students use on an ongoing basis to manage their stress and you know develop mindfulness. But then there's also services such as you will that you can partner with uh, to add to the array of offerings that you have within your counseling centers. So looking at all of these different things being done, all of the pieces are coming out. You know, although it's a very difficult situation to be in, uh, I think I find myself very hopeful about the direction that we're going in and the amount of attention and the care that has been given uh, to this very important issue so that we can ultimately benefit the students that we need. Um, so that's pretty much that. Uh, happy to take any questions. Okay. Um, do we have questions for, for Dr. Joshi? Uh, Ike? Thank you for your presentation. Um, in the um, presentation, you noted that there was a disproportionate impact among minority students. Um, did you look at that in terms of the broad approach? Or did you look at any distinctions, for example, institutional, i.e., what is the impact of minority students at HBCUs versus other institutions? Or do you have the same uh, consistent pattern in both? Or did you look at that at all? So uh, can you, I'm not sure I understood the question. Could you please let me, let me go back. Yeah. You indicated there was a yes. higher proportion of minority students mm -hmm. was impacted. Uh, is that generally, or did you have a separate approach that looked, for example, at HBCU? Oh, okay. Yeah. So, and what would be, if there's any difference, if you didn't look at that. Exactly. At so the reason that I looked at was looking at it generally, right? But I, you know, I think if you were to look at HBCU specifically, uh, again, I think that would be interesting research <laughs> to look at as well. And I go back and look at that. But in this, for this purposes of this presentation, I looked at the broad uh, category. So you said you'll look at that later? Yes, I will look later. at that later. Yes, Gary. Thank you for that uh, great presentation. Uh, I know that um, College Park has an excellent program, and if Townsend does, I know uh, UMB. Uh, I'm particularly aware of, um, and all the universities have uh, excellent programs. Is there a, um, a, a forum in which all the experts get together and create and share best practices? Yes, there is. So led by Dr. Bowman and Dr. Lee and Dr. Warren Kelly, who is the Senior Associate Vice President of Student Affairs, all the directors within the USM system actually get together on a monthly basis 
and talk about the trends that we are seeing at all of our counseling sisters, sister, uh, counseling centers within the USM system, uh, ways in which we are trying to address the trends, and then take information away uh, to inform our own practice within our own institutions as well. Thank you. Bill? I'd like to thank you as well for your presentation. Um, my question has to do with all of these stressors that you've described. Um, have you noticed a trend where any students who are so stressed are starting to harm themselves? Is there an increase in that type of unfortunate activity? Yes, so as I mentioned, uh, if you look at the last 20 years, there is an increasing number of students who are struggling with suicidal ideation, who are struggling with uh, having attempted suicide before uh, in, as a result of them having to deal with the significant stress. So, so that's an unfortunate and a difficult trend that's emerged over the last 20 years. But my question was more focused uh, on actual attempts. Is that up to up as well? That is up as well. Uh, it does actually, and um, there's actually uh, an institute at the University of Illinois that tracks student suicide over the la, you know, from a year to year basis, and they've also seen uh, an increase in that uh, over the last twenty years. Uh, now, what we see more, majority of the impact is actually on the suicidal ideation piece rather than the attempt piece, so that the proportion of increase when it comes to attempt is smaller than the proportion of increase when it comes to ideation, meaning thinking about suicide. Thank you. Andy? Thank you for the presentation. What do you make of the provocative argument that Haidt and Lukianoff made, I guess in 2018, 2019, in Coddling of the American Mind, I think in the Atlantic, and then they had a book. Essentially, their argument was K-12 institutions and some higher ed institutions with the best of intentions are teaching what I think they call like anti-resilient behavior that there are things that our institutions could do more with kids, especially at an early age, to get ahead of some of these problems. Provocative argument, but made a big splash. Do you have no. any thoughts about it? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, I think it's, I, and this is a question that I get asked frequently. So in general, I try to stay away from painting uh, students who are coming out of the K through 12 system or, uh, you, you know, our university students one way or the other as being resilient or not resilient. I have, I, the way I would respond to that question is that it really is a mix, right? So if I look, if I, you know, so I told, I mentioned earlier that we do the student census survey, and as a part of the student census survey that's been done over the last 55 years, over the last, you know, four or five years, I've looked at some of the qualitative responses that students write in, and there are tremendous stories of post-traumatic growth that show that students are resilient, that students have struggled with, with a lot of things, but they're still doing what they need to be doing. So I would say my answer to that question is yes and no, right? There might be some <laughs> things that K through 12 and, uh, and us as universities are doing that might, you know, cause that, or that, that might be in that way, uh, that might, you know, maybe lead to that less resiliency. But I would say that there's also a lot of residency that exists. Um, and, uh, you know, and that's really an important piece over here, right? Because it's only to challenges, it's only to experiencing difficulties that you build character, that you're able to kind of grow. And I'm seeing that in students on a basis. Thank you. Uh, Bob, and then Ada. My question was around the, um, the economic impact. So do, do you see a difference between students who come from low income backgrounds versus affluent backgrounds in neighborhoods? Absolutely. Absolutely right. So, as I mentioned before, uh, the trend of our minoritized students, uh, and then you know, a proportion, of, a large proportion of them, unfortunately, also come from those social economic. That proportion, that segment, being more significantly impacted, is very much a trend that is, you know, that is very clear to all of the collegiate mental health research. So, regardless of of, of ethnicity, low income students tend to show. Hello, I'm Amin Tabro from Bowie State University, and I'm so glad to, uh, thank you for your presentation. I'm so glad that you brought up the uh, point about our hybrid uh, services, because throughout this pandemic, we have increased telehealth. And I'm wondering if you're seeing a difference in black and brown communities uh, in availing themselves of services now because of telehealth. Uh, there's such a stigma mm -hmm. in uh, these communities, and yet I'm wondering if telehealth is showing 
perhaps that might eliminate that, that barrier for black and brown communities. Can you speak to that? Yes, so, you know, my response to that would be yes. So overall, when it comes to telehealth, there is increased accessibility. But still, there are cultural barriers that exist for our minoritized students. Uh, there are understanding of mental health. There's, there's a lot of different barriers that exist still for a mental health, for a minority students that will still have to be dealt with in a mindful way, right? Uh, for telehealth to be as effective for a minority students uh, as compared to the counterpart. So yes, telehealth is there, but it's not a magic bullet. We are still going to have to make a lot of effort to go in outreach prevention, increase awareness in our minoritized students so that they feel comfortable seeking help. The, the biggest thing over here is minoritized students feeling trust, uh, you know, trust enough to be able to come in and seek out the help that they need. And so every effort that can be made to increase that trust is in that regard. So yes, to answer your question, telehealth is an excellent thing, it's a step forward, but it needs to add, there's other things that need to be added in over there for our minoritized students to really benefit well from. Thank you Ada, very much. You I agree. The last question. <laughs> Hi. Good. Good morning, Dr. Joshi. Dr. Joshi and I have met um, once before, so it's, it's good to see you again this morning. Um, I have two quick questions for you. You talked a little bit about alignment of leadership, which is definitely reassuring um, to see. But I'm curious if there's any incorporation of student leaders or student voice in that alignment, because just from my experience working as an RA, that we've talked a little bit about, I think there's a real gap in sort of the average student, that average freshman and stuff. And, and then also their awareness of what's happening, what's available and how they can access those services. Yes, you know, through all of this work of you know, setting the clinical systems, of ensuring that there's alignment at all levels, the student voice is critical in all of this, right? Uh, so, you know, you might already know, I think we've, you know, in our conversations I've talked about consistent meetings that I have with minoritized student leaders or just student leaders across the board uh, and trying to figure out not only kind of getting them engaged in a conversation about what they are seeing in the student body, but then also figuring out a way to kind of reach beyond the student leaders. Because again, student leaders represent a certain type of student, uh, but we need to be able to look beyond that and how can we go about doing that, right? So instruments such as the student census survey help with that kind of stuff, right? So there's passive student voice that's coming out through the research, there's active student voice that we engage with through these partnerships, uh, and I think that's an ongoing conversation, right? We need to continue engaging with student leaders, but we also need to engage with student leaders to figure out how to need students who are not necessarily student leaders or in that group. Absolutely, and I think resident resident life systems might be helpful. With it, yeah, sure. continuing to tap into those and find new ways to leverage those people to to get into that. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. And then quickly, I know you explained really helpfully at the beginning that you focused on people with diagnosable clinical mental health challenges. But can you talk a little bit about what innovation, what attention is being um, brought to people with? undiagnosed or non-diagnosable mental health challenges? Right. Yes. So there's a lot of innovation that's happening at that field from, from a couple of different angles, right? So there's a technology piece to this that is more and more so uh, very evident when it comes to um, working with mental health at that level. Uh, so we have apps such as Headspace or Calm, et cetera, et cetera that have either been brought in by institutions or students are aware of that uh, through uh, their engagement with those kind of apps and technology before. And that's really helping things move forward as well. But then I also see institutions doing, taking a lot of effort to set up a lot of wellness resources, right? Uh, focusing on mindfulness, focusing on the connection between mind and body through yoga, or focusing on, um, you know, or, or, or focusing on that science. Uh, over there. So those kind of efforts are really, really important because again, those are the efforts that give you the skills that, you know, like, yes, we deal with students here on the downstream when they're requiring treatment, but are, are there things that we can do upstream to try and prevent people from even jumping into the river to get to a place where they need the treatment, right? And that's, that's where the wellness resources come in. So, and that's increasing as well. As I mentioned before, more and more so, universities, uh, you know, leadership within university is looking across offices and trying to figure out how can we collaborate to set up those wellness resources. Thank you. Just a suggestion, Madam Chair, just if I can, just for the for the board, at some point, it would be great for you to have some of the counseling centers and congratulations, Dr. Yoshi, uh, 
take you through some of the wellness strategies that we're using, using the Calm app, meditation and things. I mean, things that before were considered kooky that now we really see is very important just to see what we're doing and to think about how we make sure more of the faculty and staff who are not a part of this conversation become involved as they see students with these challenges and they don't know quite what to do with them. But I think taking you through some of those exercises would give you a sense of what we're doing on our campuses. Outstanding. And uh, Dr. Josie, I have one, just one last question. If, uh, if there was one action that the board could take to assist in uh, driving all of the innovations that you're doing to address these services, what would you recommend? If there's one action, I would say, so I see, you know, the leaders at our institution, presidents, you know, uh, vice president of student affairs, etc., very thoroughly plugged into some of these issues. I see, you know, them being also plugged in with student leaders. So I would say, you know, if there's increased conversation and to get like a good understanding of what's going on and then based off of that conversation efforts to perhaps you know increase financial resources or what have you i think that could go along right. well i want to thank you for such an informative presentation and for helping us you know separate fact from fiction or myth and so this is a very serious problem when we take it that way so thank you again Chancellor Kerman uh, will provide his report next. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Chair Gooden. Uh, it's been a great morning already, in my view. Uh, especially because uh, we recognized our outstanding faculty. Uh, uh, I think I speak for all of us in saying it was an honor uh, to hear about their work and uh, to thank them for their scholarship uh, and their service. And I also want to thank uh, Dr. Joshi uh, for this forum, if you will, on student mental health. Uh, we know the last couple of years have exacerbated what was long a mental health crisis on uh, college campuses. It's an issue that's uh, profoundly important to our leadership here. It's the number one thing we hear about from our students as well as our uh, faculty and staff. And I think the depth and insight of your questions as a board uh, reflects your understanding of uh, the depth of this uh, issue. Uh, turning to the board, uh, I want to offer all of you uh, my thanks, our thanks, for selecting uh, such a worthy successor to UMBC President Freeman Rabowski. Uh, the universal praise uh, that's greeted the appointment of Dr. Valerie Ashby uh, is a striking endorsement of your choice. Can we give the region a part of the board? Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, uh, we'll have many more opportunities to, uh, to celebrate Freeman's legacy uh, and also to share our excitement uh, at our new colleague's arrival. And then there'll be one more to come uh, as we thank President Wright. And uh, Dr. Schatzel, uh, you need to be thanked again uh, for hosting us today, for showcasing TU's excellent. I know that's not hard to do. You would be the first to agree, and I agree with you. So thank you. Uh, starting with the Tigers, uh, the Tigers just celebrated, that's Towson. Yep. Uh, the Tigers <laughs> just celebrated impressive Fulbright recognition. Uh, with one student, three recent alums, receiving Fulbright Awards uh, that will advance their teaching and research in Spain, Italy, and the UK. Um, Towson's most prolific Fulbright cycle yet. And as we speak, uh, Towson has two student-led startups competing for more than $200,000 in prize money 
at eFest. That's the country's premier college entrepreneurship challenge. Earlier this month, Towson held a grand opening for this beautifully expanded and renovated university union, a brand new U to, I think that's the catch word, yeah, to accommodate TU significant growth. Uh, congratulations, Kim. Uh, now I want to expand uh, my remarks to the rest of the system. Uh, and I'll remind you that my full report is online. So if I'm consolidating this, you can just imagine. Uh, I start with, with, with our excellence, and there are plenty of examples to be found. U.S. News and World Report uh, released its graduate school rankings recently. And I can tell you that the system was abundantly represented. College Park had 56 top 25 programs, including top 10. You might want to hold your applause for me. You want to get rid of me? Uh, at UMB, uh, every school clinched an overall ranking in the top 25 or had individual top 25 programs. Uh, the School of Nursing at UMB had five top 10 specialties. And our newest R1 university, UMBC, ranked in statistics, computer science, engineering disciplines. Congratulations to all of you. Uh, but it wasn't just our R1s that made the cut. Every eligible USM institution made those rankings, including education at Frostburg and Salisbury, computer science at Bowie State and Towson, rehabilitation counseling at Coppin State and UMES, and the clinical training program at Ubald Law clinched a top 10 spot. Uh, I also want to note one more ranking, Victory, and the C is replaced by a Q, Victory, which serves military personnel and their spouses transitioning into civilian life, has given five of our universities its military-friendly schools rating. I think we can be very proud of that. Salisbury, Towson, Ubald, UMES, and for the 11th straight year, Ron Frostberg. Uh, Salisbury has excelled in Fulbright Awards. A record nine students or recent alums selected for the upcoming cycle of the Fulbright Student Program. And for the cycle that's wrapping up soon, Salisbury was one of just five U.S. institutions recognized as both a top producer of Fulbright students and a top producer of Fulbright scholars. Chuck, congratulations. Uh, so we can move from institutional excellence and look at individual excellence. Total of four UMBC students, UMBC students, Christopher Slaughter, Rachel Myers, Toby Majeka Dunmi, and Dewan Moreland were named Goldwater Scholars, as were three College Park students, Patrick Kim, George Lee, Kevin Chu. They're all going to receive substantial scholarships for advanced study in science and engineering and math. And we just got good news that three USM faculty members among only 28 nationwide were named 2022 Carnegie Fellows. From College Park, Sarah Cameron in the Department of History and Rayshawn Ray in Sociology, and from UMBC, George Derrick Musgrove in History. Uh, this is one of the most prestigious prizes in the humanities and social sciences each fellow receives $200,000 to support their research and writing. And then we also celebrated at Bowie State the fact that junior student, Paige Blake, 
was appointed by President Biden to serve on his board of advisors on HBCUs. Total of 18 members on the board, period. And uh, our student, our Bowie State student among them, uh, serving alongside some of the country's most prominent leaders in education, business, the arts, advocacy, and culture. Uh, send our congratulations, President Roe, to Paige. Uh, and our universities are growing their programs and their reach. Frostburg has introduced three new academic programs, including one that's in partnership with UMES. And you all know that pleases this chancellor. Uh, it's an accelerated pharmacy track uh, that allows completion of a PharmD, that's bachelor's through doctorate, in just six years, instead of the traditional eight. Uh, the NSA recently designated Bowie State a national center of academic excellence in cybersecurity, meaning that the school students are going to be heavily recruited for the US front lines in cyber. And UMGC has several new partnerships, one with Guild Education that will open up UMGC's range of career-focused degrees and certificate programs to many more adult learners. And UMGC is also working with the EdTech company, Victory XR, which uses virtual and augmented reality to create a digital twin campus makes their online classes more immersive and interactive. And at UMB, the School of Medicine has a new center for advanced research training and innovation. Uh, it's intended to grow and develop the next generation of clinician scientists and biomedical research scientists. And that center is gonna be led by my long-term colleague, friend, uh, Dean Al Reese, as he transitions back to the faculty following 16 years as Dean. And here's a feel good story. Coppin State President Anthony Jenkins, he went to Philadelphia last month uh, to help rename the former Andrew Jackson Elementary School. Uh, the school is now the Fanny Jackson Coppin Elementary School. Uh, in honor of uh, Fanny Coppin, who was a trailblazing educator. Uh, and President Jenkins surprised those kids and their families. Uh, in Philadelphia, he announced free tuition to CSU for any Coppin Elementary alum after they graduate high school. That's a great way. <laughs> way to throw a pipeline. Uh, let me turn to the partnerships, grants, and gifts that are amplifying our academic, economic, and social impact. I was talking about Coppin State. Coppin State announced a partnership with the Charles Schwab Foundation and Advisor Services that's going to position the university as a major hub for financial education and services accompanied by the single largest gift in CSU history. Uh, the partnership will bring diversity to the financial services industry, making it more reflective of current and future investors and build wealth in communities uh, that have long been deprived of wealth. Uh, UMSIS has entered into an expansive partnership with Baltimore-based U.S. Wind. With $11 million in funding over eight years, UMSEs will conduct three research projects aimed at understanding the potential effects of offshore wind development on marine animals, fish, birds. The timing of these projects is critical uh, as offshore wind farms make their way to our state's coast. Uh, and building on the high profile success of its partnership, Heidi, with Alaska Airlines, 
uh, UMES just announced that Republic Airways is its latest corporate aviation partner. And Troon, the world's biggest golf and club management company, has just launched a scholarship program for students in UMES's PGA golf management program. Uh, with a gift from Whiting Turner, matched by Maryland's Innovation Fund, Towson is launching an interdisciplinary cybersecurity center, uh, appointing its first endowed professor of cybersecurity and researchers at UMB School of Medicine won five and a half million dollars from NIH to prepare the next generation of global health scientists, something that's very timely right now. And two College Park faculty won over two and a half million dollars from the Defense Department to study how national security and climate change intersect nationally and globally. In philanthropy news, uh, the estate of George Miles, a NASA engineer, made two huge gifts supporting student scholarships, $3.3 million a piece to Salisbury and UMES. And in the largest gift in UMBC's history, $21 million from the Sherman Family Foundation is going to help launch the Betsy and George Sherman Center. It's a center that will expand and integrate UMBC's work in teacher preparation, school partnerships, applied research focused on early childhood education and hopefully improved outcomes for Baltimore City students. This kind of outreach and engagement are emblematic of the system's commitment to service and social justice. College Park recently broke ground on Collins Plaza, honoring First Lieutenant Richard Collins, a Bowie State <laughs> student killed on the College Park campus in 2017. President Pines and President Bro used the ceremony to rededicate themselves and their universities to racial equity and justice. And UBALT launched its Center for Criminal Justice Reform with a gift from UBALT law alum, Sam Rose. The center is going to address the criminal justice system, uh, which as you know, is burdened by mass incarceration, uh, concerns about equitable prosecution, juvenile justice, justice failures, and something that worries us all, rising violence. And on the world stage, UBALT law professor Margaret Johnson was just announced as a Fulbright scholar. She's going to continue her studies into gender equity issues in Australia. BSU became the nation's first HBCU to sponsor a national PBS film. Uh, the subjects are certainly worth it. Uh, the documentaries produced by Fire, Firelight Films explore the lives and work of two Maryland natives, both towering figures, of course, in the struggle to end slavery, Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass. And as part of a groundbreaking partnership with the International Rescue Committee, College Park is temporarily housing several refugee and evacuee families from Afghanistan. These are people who work alongside U.S. military personnel. Uh, this approach to resettlement is the first of its kind for a public university, and I know UMD is proud to offer these families sanctuary as the International Rescue Committee helps them find permanent housing, jobs, counseling uh, services. Uh, as chancellor, and I know speaking for all of us, I'm justifiably proud of so much we do as a system. Uh, our commitment to service is uh, among my greatest sources of pride. Let me just turn now to the completed legislative session. The operating budget submitted by the governor, approved by the legislature, showed historic support for higher education in the USM. The budget cuts we suffered early in the pandemic were fully restored. 
tens of millions of dollars were added in new funding. Uh, this important support will allow us to expand financial aid for students to keep college affordable for more Marylanders. New funding for our HBCUs uh, will enable scholarships, faculty recruitment, academic innovation. State dollars uh, that support the operation of new and renovated facilities will expand education and research capacity across the state and money allocated for pay raises <coughs> will help us attract and retain the faculty and staff who are the very people responsible for so much of what I've talked about, for Maryland's unparalleled success uh, in college attainment and quality. And turning to the capital budget, again, the word historic comes to mind. Uh, the General Assembly approved every one of our projects included in the governor's capital budget, committing more than $500 million, the largest single year capital appropriation ever for the U.S. Senate. Uh, the projects include the chemistry building at College Park, uh, the Martin Luther King Jr. Communication Arts and Humanities building at Bowie State, the College of Health Professions building, at TU, the School of Pharmacy and Health Profession buildings at UMES, and significant funding, terribly important, for facilities renewal system-wide. Clearly, our leaders in Annapolis <coughs> value public higher education. You've heard me say this, it's among all the other important aspects of this, it's why we get such outstanding candidates who want to be presidents in this system. Uh, our governmental leaders are invested in us. Uh, they get the importance of it. Uh, so I'm grateful on behalf of all of us, to Governor Hogan uh, and to the legislature for their commitment to the university system and the work we do. And I'm grateful as well to our government relations team led by Patrick Hogan and colleagues throughout the system uh, for steering us through such a productive session. They had a big assist from academic and student affairs led by Dr. Boffman and administration and finance uh, led by the intrepid Ellen Herbst. Uh, thank you all. Uh, one final thought before I close. Uh, the pandemic going to endemic. Things obviously look very different today, fortunately, than they did even a year ago. Federal and state public health authorities have begun transitioning their COVID disease response from a pandemic to an endemic uh, phase of infection. And system-wide, our vaccination rates are high, our disease positivity rates are low. So as we enter this phase, this uh, next phase, endemic disease, uh, the USM strongly encourages all of our students, faculty, and staff, unless exempted, uh, to be fully vaccinated and up to date uh, on booster shots when eligible so that we'll be well positioned uh, to remain safe this coming fall. And of course, we'll continue to analyze data and policy developments so that our universities are prepared to have what they need as they consider their campus protocols going forward. I wanna thank all of our institutions for their continued leadership in protecting public health and safety. And uh, with apologies for the length, but uh, believe me, I've left out a lot I should have told you. Uh, Madam Chair, that concludes my report. Well, thank you, Chancellor. Thank you for the comprehensive report and thank you for your leadership. Another round of applause. We'll now have the report of councils and our first report, the Council of University System Faculty will be delivered by Dr. Tatum. 
the vice chair. Madam Chair, she comes up. I just want to say, I've never seen a chancellor doing more than we get from this guy. Would you give Jay another one? <laughs> He shows again that leadership matters. You're right. Good morning, everyone. Chair Gooden, uh, Chancellor Perman, the Regents, the Presidents. It's an honor to be here this morning. I am Dr. Arian Tatum from Coppin State University, and I am also the current uh, CUSIF Vice Chair. So Elizabeth couldn't be here today because she has a back injury. So we wish her well uh, on recovery, but she has. Um, <laughs> Giving me her lengthy comments that I'm <laughs> that I am going to uh, go through quickly. I'm shorter than I thought. Okay, so we first want to talk to you a little bit about what we've been doing at QCIF before I move on to the academic integrity and uh, technology survey results. So <clears throat> we elected a new chair, Dr. Holly Brewer from um, University of Maryland, and a new vice chair. Uh, Dr. Heather Haverback from Towson University. The remaining members of XCOM will be voted on on our next meeting in May. Dr. Brun will remain on as the, the past chair in that capacity. On April 6, QCIF hosted the semi-annual Faculty Senate Chairs meeting as a part of the shared governance facet of QCIF's work. Um, I had the honor of hosting the Faculty Senate Chairs after a great discussion over uh, faculty mental health and a frank discussion with the chancellor and other and each other, the group has asked to increase the number of meetings so that they can collaborate and better guide their faculty sentence. And I was a bit shocked about that. I thought that two meetings, you know, per academic year was enough, but they have been getting emails about how excited they were. And they also want to form like some kind of collaborative group to ask questions and, you know, bounce ideas off of and things like that. So I thought that was awesome. So we'll put that, um, we'll put that on the books for next academic year. Continuing the work on shared governance, Dr. Brun, myself, and President Bro met to discuss how we could improve shared governance on our campuses. We identified the need for work on clarifying the roles and responsibilities, better communication, and establishing trust as a beginning point. We have placed it also on our fall action plan. The final update on shared governance, Dr. Brun presented um, the complete shared governance survey report and individual school response documents via Zoom to Chancellor Perman and Vice Chancellor Bogman on April 19th. The individual school responses are confidential and for the Chancellor's use only, therefore we will not release this information publicly. However, the aggregate data will be reported to QCIF at the May 13th meeting and will then be reported to you at the July meeting. This year's survey responses should be should provide a good starting place with our work with President Bro. So now I'll move on to the academic integrity survey results. You have actually been given the academic integrity survey results and data PowerPoint as an attachment to this report. Um, there were almost 800 open responses to the AI report. In the interest of time, I will focus on the recommendations of the report. So this survey aimed to ascertain how faculty perceived what was needed to make a learning environment of integrity. A learning environment of integrity, of course, requires a commitment on behalf of all members of the institution. And from the survey, it was concluded that there was a lack of strong communication. There were difficulties circulating this survey on campuses, suggesting communication process problems that will hamper efforts to promote a culture of academic integrity. Recognizing new norms, that was something else that, that was teased out. Disciplines make a difference. Students need to be socialized on conventions for learning with, with integrity at, um, that better reflect and respect historic and emerging academic professional norms and practices within and across disciplines. So some of us know that, you know, in certain disciplines, we work in groups. 
um, in certain math disciplines, you know, it is expected that students arrive at, this, at the same answer. So it, it's not feasible to use items such as Turnitin for um, those particular assignments. Something else that was teased out, discipline specific consensus. Consensus needs to be developed among disciplines on consistent definitions of and approaches to handling acts of academic misconduct on campus. Each institution needs to understand its students and faculty attitudes and behaviors. So using this survey as a guide, further research should be conducted by each institution in the USM to understand their student and faculty attitudes and behaviors on academic integrity. The last thing is that QCIF should endorse the participation of individual USM institutions in the new academic integrity surveys to be conducted by the International Center for Academic Integrity or the ICAI to get a larger perspective on student attitudes. Dr. Brown wanted to also add an important point that Efforts to educate faculty on the part of QCIF and campus shared governance faculty groups should be continued. Comments made in the survey all too often focused on challenging challenges facing um, academic integrity on campuses, such as plagiarism and uh, purchasing papers. Technology, though, and its many uses are a big concern. She feels that if we arm ourselves with the knowledge of what creating, um, of what cheating is, and the problems, those actual problems that we face other than plagiarism and purchasing papers, we can then counter with better ways to teach integrity. So now I'll move on to the cybersecurity survey. The cybersecurity survey had approximately 365 responses, and its purpose was to identify areas of concern that faculty had around the need for training, availability of campus policies, and safety equipment. So the following recommendations were made. Awareness around phishing should be improved. Awareness of training and resources needs improvement. Cybersecurity policies and training can be improved. Establish free access to secure VPN for everyone. And institutional guidelines for passwords and authentication should be re-examined. Um, I'll take questions if you have any. This was a very comprehensive report <laughs> this period and very informative. Um, I particularly was uh, intrigued by the shared governance discussion um, where you said communication was the number one issue or that's what was written in the report. Do you think that um, much of that is due to COVID and that rapid shift to remote learning that it may be accelerated this problem? I, no, I don't think so. I think the, the communication problem um, kind of happened before COVID. And I think it, it probably stems around the, the roles and the definitions of what actual shared governance is. Um, that's some, the conversation that um, Dr. Brun, President Bro, and myself actually had, is that um, the, the stakeholders in the shared governance game are not sure what each other does. You know, <laughs> so I think that's a part of the work that we can all do um, with um, QCIF and CUS and um, definitely with um, this, what, the president's CUS. Sorry, I forgot one of the, <laughs> the yeah. CUS. So, yes, thank you for that question. Any other questions? Hearing none, thank you. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to welcome Dr. Shoshana to do the Council University of System Staff Report. I'm going to hope that I don't mess up this laptop that's here by putting my notes here, so we'll see how this goes. Um, good morning, Chair Gooden, Chancellor Perman, members of the board, presidents, guests. I'm very excited to be here with you this morning for what will be my second to last report to the board as the Chair of CUS. So I have a handful of updates. I'm not 
my council said I need to stop being so excited, but <laughs> I'm very excited for a new chair to step in next year. Um, it has been wonderful, though, and I have loved being here. And I actually, it is very bittersweet that my tenure is coming to an end. Um, so I have a few updates on behalf of CUS. Um, we have met twice since the last meeting of the board, um, virtually in March and April. I want to first thank President Rabowski and Kathy Detloff, who's also here for hosting us virtually at UMBC at that meeting, and for Freeman sharing a little bit about his upcoming plans and retirement. Um, along that same vein, I also want to say um, thanks to the search committee and the members of the board um, on behalf of the appointment of Dr. Ashby as our incoming president. Um, I will. I would be um, remiss if I didn't say that I was a little anxious about the transition, but in seeing how Dr. Ashby has been interacting with our community already, um, I can say for sure Cuss, as well as staff at UMBC and many, many, many others are very excited for her to step in as the next leader of our campus. Um, and, and it's been great so far. So of course, you know, we will be very, very sad to see Freeman stepping down, but we are very excited for the appointment of Dr. Ashby as our next president. Um, and I love that she's always wearing black and gold. So we love that. That's something that I always try to do as well. Um, the other, oh, and then our second meeting in April was hosted virtually by Towson. So thank you, President Schatzel, for coming and joining us. Um, we were also able to have the president of the staff Senate join us, Heather Sorensen. So hearing about some of what amazing things are happening at Towson, but also with shared governance on this campus was um, very inspiring for our April meeting. Um, and we have three more meetings before we wrap up this cycle. So we have a lot going on. So I want to share some real quick highlights. Um, first and foremost, and I know that the chancellor shared some of this in his report, but we were excited to host our um, joint council slash partnership with the USM Women's Forum for Advocacy Day. Uh, it was virtual again this year in February, which feels like five years ago, um, but we were um, able to host an entire day of virtual sessions, interact with folks from the legislative session. I want to thank Chancellor Perman for kicking us off and kind of giving us the rah-rah inspiration that morning, and then also to Patrick um, Hogan and Andy Clark for always helping us with the logistics of that day. Um, as well as to our chairs across the councils for the legislative committees that host that event. Um, we were able to do a debrief session for the first time this year, and we really have some great ideas for how to do that advocacy work in the future, both in terms of on behalf of the system, but also on behalf of our um, respective constituency groups. So really thinking about how that looks next year in the hopes that we can do some things in person and some things virtually and really maximize the advocating that we're doing. Uh, the second update that I wanted to share is that we were able to put forward our report um, of nominations for the Board of Regents Staff Awards, um, a whole meeting early this year. So we are really trying to um, get all of the things done before we get into the summer. Um, so we had 31 nominations from 10 USM institutions, um, and we look forward to having the board review the nominations that we've put forward and then celebrating those award recipients as well as the honorable mentions in that process. Um, I would like to give very, very quick kudos to the committee that oversaw that work in terms of collecting nominations, reviewing all of the packets, and then putting forward those recommendations. Um, the chair of that committee happens to be in the room and is a Towson staff member. So thank you, Denise, for all of your work with our legislative, I mean, with our um, staff awards process. Um, and then lastly, I would like to share too, because I know this ties into the QCIF update. Um, we did finish our shared governance survey. We had 124 responses, which is up from last year, um, from all 12 of the campuses. Um, and we have sent that information to the chancellor and the presidents, but I wanted to give them some time with that information before presenting a summary to the board. So I will look forward at the June meeting um, to presenting just a, a recap of kind of where um, staff shared governance is at each of our campuses and as a system um, as a whole. So I'll share that update next month. Um, I believe that concludes my report. I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Seeing none, thank you. And we look forward to your next report. Um, Dr. Bro now will give us the Council of University System President report.
Thank you and good morning. Yes, that was a wonderful, uplifting report, Dr. Shishene. I, you know, I really should not be asked to uh, follow you. You are just always so amazing. <laughs> wonderful report. Please give her a round of applause. <laughs> And good morning, Chair Gooden, members of the Board of Regents, Chancellor Perman, colleagues, and to all who are attending today. I'd like to add our congratulations from CUSP to the award recipients recognized at this morning's ceremony. We thank them for their dedication to research, teaching, innovation, and service, and to the model of excellence that they provide to their respective campuses. As I begin my remarks, uh, we extend congratulations and appreciation to our colleagues President White at Salisbury and President Probowski of UMBC for all of your achievements to your institutions, to your universities, and to higher education. As President Probowski transitions to new endeavors, we will look forward to welcoming Dr. Valerie Shears Aspie. And it does look like she's already hit the ground running. I've seen a lot on social media of her on the campus already. So we're looking forward to welcoming her. You heard in the Chancellor's report highlights of achievements from our campuses. And we thank our campuses, our faculty, staff, and students for all of their efforts and achievements this academic year as we approach the completion of another year. The cost written report is in your board materials, and so I would point them out to your attention at this time. And CUS continues to convene regularly on matters related to COVID-19 and at the beginning of each month to address broader system-wide matters. Since its February report to the board, CUS met on several occasions and you have the dates in your written report. The noon COVID calls on post spring break protocols continued our discussion of vaccine requirements and fall planning. CUS continues to strongly encourage vaccine boosters and the March 7th and April 11th CUS meetings covered a broader system-wide number of, of issues. Vice Chancellor Hogan continued to keep us abreast of legislative system updates, and we thank him as well for his outstanding leadership throughout this, this session. The presidents also discussed shared governance, as you just heard. We're very pleased to be working along with CUSEF and our other shared governance groups to address shared governance on our respective campuses. Campuses approach, uh, our approach to tuition and mandatory fees and community policing were also among the other topics that we have discussed as, uh, as CUS has gone through our different meetings. And we also have addressed the UMB Cure Scholars Program and economic sanctions with regard to Russia. CUS also had an additional in-depth conversation about the COVID-19 protocols at our April 11th meeting. This now concludes my report, and I'm looking for Madam Chair. Are there any questions? Any questions of Dr. Bro? Seeing none, thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now hear from the Student Council, Ms. Harper. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So I had mine on a laptop, so I don't remember. It's an after go after you. So. Uh. <laughs> Good morning, uh, Chancellor, President, uh, Chair Goodman. Good Goodman, I'm good din, sorry. Um, so I want to go really briefly because I know we want to save some time and eat some lunch. So first things first, mental health, right? So we had a brief on mental health and how what the students are feeling. I'm going to give you that perspective because Ada and I told us, We've been talking about this throughout the year. President Fabrowski has set the tone from the first meeting we had of the Board of Regents. What are the students feeling? And it's been in my head since then. The students are stressed. We heard from the clinical side of things of, this is what they, 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 they're struggling with on the clinical side of things. But what are the students who are not diagnosed, who are not the ones that are, have a, a paper or documentation from their doctors to say, hey, they need this accommodation or they need this. Students need flexibility, students need support, students need more resources. Students do not need to hear, oh, well, this is not a good semester, so you should drop out. Students have been hearing that, and it's not good. So um, I want to always give a positive report, but we have to always give what's, what's true. And it's getting a lot of uh, attention. Mental health is getting a lot of attention right now. Their, uh, their mental capacity is being stretched, and we need to address that. And I think. 
and we've been trying to work as community throughout this time, this entire time as my presidency in term is that we've been trying to fill community. How can we help? We've set up one-on-ones with students, visiting um, SGA meetings, GSA meetings, group meetings, putting students in group meetings so they can feel comfortable with talking to myself and Ada and Tova and other student leaders to feel like they're not talking to leadership or faculty that are in the USM system. Um, and this is what we're getting. They're like, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't, I don't know what, I, what am I, what am I doing? Um, so we need some support. What does that look like? Looking at students that go to University of Maryland College Park, they we have a young lady, uh, Venevi. She does yoga. We talked about doing um, some videos where we could pre-record these videos, and they do this in the session in the general assembly. They re-record, they pre-record the videos, and they do a, uh, yoga, and then you release them on Monday and Wednesdays, and you just send them out. It's simple things that the <laughs> students need. Um, what is it that they like? They mention things about painting. They mention things about just having someone talk to them, like a, we talked about the Calm app, but they also want someone, to know, hey, how are you feeling, and a, a check-in. So um, what does that look like? I would like to sit down with presidents. My term is over soon in July, July 1, but if we have time between now and then to sit down and really talk about how does this look, what has, the students said to me directly when it comes to the particular institutions, we don't want to say that here at this meeting, but if we can have a private meeting, that would be, that would be well. So um, not all negative, positive. What did we get from that? We decided to create a mental health committee. So we did that. We, um, we created a mental health committee for the University System of Maryland Student Council. We appointed a chair who is actually from Towson. Um, her name is Anna. And so they're going to continue that on to next year as well. Um, moving forward, we also have decided to give students something outside of just saying, hey, you're dealing with some stressors. OK, go do your homework, go home. How do we reward them? And so what that looks like for us is starting, you guys have faculty staff uh, awards. We decided to do a uh, university system student council awards. Myself and my executive team will fund that. I mean, I know it's just like a little gift card, but we'll select undergraduate, two undergraduates, two graduate students, and we do have a question if we could present that to them at the next Board of Regents meeting. Um, and I don't know, I don't, I'm just putting this out here. Um, I don't know what I'm supposed to talk to them about, but <laughs> this is what the students wanted. And um, if they could just be presented here, because we want them to know that we hear you, we're listening to you, and we care. Um, remember my thoughts, uh, elections. So the University System of Maryland Student Council also opened up the elections on April 27th. Um, so we've been getting a lot. But we ask all the presidents that you can announce it on your campuses so we can get the best of the best um, for the presidency, VP of undergrad, VP of uh, graduate, because we want to, again, build community, no separation. We want to make sure that everyone is working in a collaborative form. Um, so they run into uh, May the 11th, and then we will vote on uh, May 22nd. I think I said everything. Anyone have any questions? Well, thank you for your report, and the Chancellor will follow up and see if we can get the meeting schedule that you're looking for. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's now time for public comment. As you know, all regularly scheduled meetings of the Board of Regents will include a period for public comment. We've set aside 15 minutes for this purpose. We have received one comment, but it doesn't relate to an item on our agenda. Um, I want to, um, seeing that we've received no comments relative um, to the agenda for this meeting, I will move directly to the consent agenda. The next order of business being the consent agenda, decisions regarding which items to include on the consent agenda were made by me and the committee chairs. However, any regent may request that an item be removed from the consent agenda for separate review and discussion. Before I move approval of the consent agenda, I ask if there are any items that any regent would like removed from the consent agenda for separate uh, review and discussion. 
Uh, Madam Regent. Chair, um, there's a one item that um, is on the consent agenda for finance that will be discussed uh, in the following committee reports by economic development. Uh, it is a USM momentum fund, additional fund balance allocation. So I would move that we accept the consent agenda with that one modification. Okay. Any other changes to the consent agenda? Then will you move it? So move. A uh, second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion passes. The next order of business is the committee reports. First, we'll hear from Regent Atman and the Finance Committee, followed by Regent Leggett and the Committee on Economic Development and Technology Commercialization. Finally, we'll end with the Committee of the Whole and the affirmation of the UMBC president. You probably think we'd already done that, right? <laughs> yes, there's two. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, good morning. Still morning, uh, everyone. Um, it's been a great meeting today. Um, first item I would uh, like to uh, bring up, it's an action item related to the approval of uh, uh, the USM uh, fiscal 2023 schedule of tuition and mandatory fees. So this is the time of the year when our finance departments all want to um, prepare uh, the billing process. And um, so we, um, and we're through the legislature. So we know what our uh, generous uh, uh, legislature and governor um, uh, provided for us this year. Um, so uh, we are now, uh, we now have attached to this item schedules of tuition and mandatory fees. Um, let me just say a couple of things in, in advance of making the motion. First of all, the USM continues to recognize our responsibility uh, for the importance and affordability and, and the importance of afford providing an affordable product to students and families, as well as maintaining the operational vitality uh, necessary on our campuses. So with a few isolated exceptions, undergraduate uh, tuition for FY 2023 is a modest increase uh, for in-state tuition of 2% um, and resident undergraduate. Uh, also tuition rates for non-resident and graduate students will increase with one or two exceptions, um, no more than 5%. This increase will uh, enable USM institutions to remain uh, very price competitive and concurrently foster an affordable and challenging higher education learning experience. Uh, student affordability is a priority consideration when increasing any costs at our universities, uh, including tuitions and fees. Um, we do not take this uh, uh, any increase lightly. As costs increase, every effort is made to increase financial aid in order to maintain financial aid packages in line with proposed tuition and fee increases with a particular focus on need-based aid in order to address some of the concerns surrounding student affordability. So turning to the schedule, um, just wanna point out a few specific items. Uh, we had, uh, if you uh, uh, call your attention to the University of Maryland College Park, um, their resident tuition number is at 2%, but they have bundled some other fees that logically relate to that, uh, including uh, tuition or technology, performing arts, health center, facilities, um, about $515 of mandatory fees into the cost of tuition for FY 2023. Now, even including all of that, uh, this is a very affordable institution it would rank ninth out of 13 of the public institutions in the Big Ten Athletic Academic Alliance. Um, and another benefit to bundling these uh, fees is, is that uh, graduate students often get um, uh, uh, financial aid based on tuition, and this would um, enable them to access uh, higher levels of tuition. So uh, that's what's happening at the University of Maryland College Park. Uh, Ask President Pines if there's anything he'd like to add related to that. 
Uh, thank you, Regent uh, Admin. Um, so just on the graduate uh, sort of um, tuition remission is typically paid um, through grants. And so what the benefit to graduate students is they'll get a net $515 back into their monthly accounts. And so that will enable them to use that for other cost of living expenses. So it's a wonderful opportunity for graduate students and lessens their burdens as students. Great, thanks. Um, uh, the um, couple of other things just wanted to point out on the uh, tuition side, um, which uh, technically move the number above 2%. Uh, one is University of Maryland, Baltimore. Um, the, um, at, we had talked, uh, I think a year ago about um, some uh, particularly uh, uh, unique costs associated with the BSN tuition clinical education cost. Um, and we are phasing in uh, a new uh, tuition rate there. This is the second year, I believe. Yeah, second year of a three year phase in uh, for those costs. So there's an additional $1,000 uh, annually. And again, that's still a very cost competitive uh, product. Um, I'd also like to mention that at UMES, uh, consistent with the board's April 2021 proposal approval, uh, the physician assistant program is in year two of a three year implementation program. Uh, resident tuition rates will increase by 15% uh, for this program and non-resident rates by 10%. Based on the market, UMES will still be well below uh, the PA current market averages once the final rate increases are implemented in fall 2023. And we want this to be a vibrant and successful program, uh, which is why we're making sure that there's sufficient funding available for that. Um, turning to fees for a second, uh, mandatory fees are also included on this schedule. Um, as a reminder, mandatory fees uh, support services and activities that are not primarily funded by either tuition revenue or state general funds. And this would include um, among other things, athletics, student unions, recreational centers. Uh, for a large majority of campuses, uh, the increase in fees can be attributed to increases in COLA and merit, as well as increases in the cost of goods and services. So we know there's a lot of inflation going on. Uh, in terms of COLA, if the state uh, provides an increase for part of the campus, we have to step up and provide it uh, for the balance uh, of the folks working there. Um, and that runs through to the fees. Um, so you'll see the fee schedule here. Just one thing I wanted to call attention to related to this schedule, um, that we had that excellent presentation on student mental health today. And the Univ University of Maryland College Park is proposing, you'll see, um, to add a new student counseling fee of $15 to aid in the significant increase in the demand for mental health services at the university. And um, uh, this fee, I believe, will grow um, up to $50 per student um, to over three years. And it's to deal with the kinds of issues uh, that were discussed this morning, uh, rapid access treatment modality, staffing, um, this very important counseling center, et cetera. So um, uh, anyway, the, re the rest of the fees are laid out uh, in the schedule and I would move for the approval of, of the tuition and mandatory fee schedule as submitted. Is there a second? Any discussion? Oh, oh, can I just add one other thing sure. before? Um, I just wanted to mention that there is a, a robust student um, engagement process in setting uh, the tuition uh, and the fees in particular, uh, setting the fees. Um, and um, it seems to work pretty well, but you, you can discuss that. But first, uh, Regent Leggett. I was recently talking to a student who's not part of our system and remarking about the overall fee structure in his institution, but the tuition. Uh, but he said uh, the, the overall tuition and so forth, room and board was okay, but I am being nickel and dime by all of the fees. So if we were to look comparatively at our fee structure, uh, do you have any analysis or backup of how that basic compares? Because that just stunned me when he said, well, you know, I'm okay with the tuition, but I'd be a nickel and dime by all of the various fees that I have to pay. Yeah, uh, there, uh, there are the mandatory fees and the um, self-support fees, which we'll talk about next. Um, 
you know, I think that um, we do, the fees range from 1% to 9% of, of, of an increase this year. Um, um, in terms of nickel and diming, I think the approach that College Park is taking may be something that catches on throughout the system. We'll see see how it goes. But um, you know, uh, I would ask uh, Vice Chancellor Herbst if she, or Chancellor, yes, yeah, the Chancellor wants to okay. say something Thank you. here. <laughs> you you may recall a comment I made. Maybe I shouldn't have made it uh, several months ago when I alluded to certain airlines who would also say Regent Legged uh, that. Uh, you know, you got to pay for the Coke, you got to pay for the bag. Uh, you know, I might say I'm being nickel and dimed, uh, and I don't blame the students for feeling that way. And my own feeling is that we ought to take more of a College of Park approach uh, on these fees. Let's just be honest about it. Much of this is the cost of getting an education, and it ought to be built into the tuition so that people don't feel nickel and dimed. Sure, I can speak first very quickly on that, but then also if you'd like me to say anything about any of the student engagement on the conversation. Whatever you'd like to. Sure. Um, I think I would definitely echo echo what you're saying, that it, it, it can feel frustrating um, and also just challenging as a student to navigate, understand, interpret, and then respond to um, the financial materials that you come into contact with. And at a state institution, we have a really wide range of students um, in terms of their financial resources and their financial literacy. And so I think one of the big barriers to students is financial literacy, that people don't understand and feel confident and comfortable interpreting um, the documents that they have to read to pay for tuition and their fees. But I think honestly that if we can, I know I've mentioned this before, but if we can find a way to make it more transparent, um, not just, again, when you're a student, we talked about being a student leader and the different level of engagement and understanding that you can participate in as a student leader versus an average student somehow incorporating into some of our first year seminars and things like that um, conversations about tuition and fees because it is not good to be in the dark and that's when people feel frustrated and nickel and dimed. Um, so I think to explain why the fees are there and when I look at these, I, I understand better from my perspective now why things have to be the way they are and you find a way to pay them and continue your education. So um, yeah, that's all I'll say about that. And then in terms of student engagement, um, again, transparency is something that I've had students at multiple universities come to me with concerns about that they feel like in their process of discussing and approving and communicating with their presidents about tuition and fees, they feel like they, um, they're, too many gaps in in conversations. They'll have one conversation, and then three, four months later, they'll have another. But the decisions have been made at that point, and so they want to find a way to streamline the conversation from the bottom up um, more effectively. And that would be a conversation for each individual university to have with their student government. But I know College Park student government has come to me with concerns about that, as well as UMBC. In particular and then um, uh, athletics athletic fees are the only other thing that some universities again in particular UMBC has concerns about um, and have expressed concerns to me over um, bearing the burden of elevating and developing the their athletics um, and how that falls on the average student when um, it's not even all of the students who get to benefit from that, especially graduate students have a lot of frustration about that. Um, so those conversations happen at SGA and then they, they happen between us at USMSC meetings. But if anyone has questions um, or wants to hear more about those conversations I've had, I'd be happy to talk more about them. So Thank you. Well, either the president's... Uh, um, yeah, I, one, one of the things I want to say that goes to the point about the fees and I appreciate talking with my students because we've had these conversations that two things we are a nerdy campus 
So everybody is not, some people didn't know we had basketball. So that's just, that's one of them. But I want the regents to remember that unlike every other campus in the state of public, in the state of Maryland, UMBC has to pay for its event center, $100 million from student fees because of program duplication, racial politics. We were not allowed to have physical education by another institution. And as a result, the only way we could help our students to have a better center than what we had had, which was like a high school facility was, and we did work with students who agreed to do it. Now, those students who make that agreement have graduated two or three years ago. Many are in law school now, our mm -hmm. lawyers. The new students are saying, why must we pay these fees when other campuses don't? Well, it's, it's the racial policy. It's the program right. duplication. Not to complain, but right. that is the fact. Yeah. So that's, it's a yeah. reality that I hope when I'm gone one day, we want UMBC and other campuses won't have that problem of not being able to have the programs it should have. And so I guess, um, Ada, to your, your question, and to your recommendation, um, it sounds like the campuses just need to do a better job of every incoming class educating them on what the fees are, why they're there, and probably a little background on how they got there. That would be helpful so, and, and, as part and of you, freshman orientation. But you yeah. should understand, I mean, the most important thing is that we have the conversations. My yeah. students have had the yeah. conversations. They don't like the answers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't blame them. And I say, well, get the governor, get the state to right. decide, give us the money for the PE building that every other campus gets but ours. You get what I'm yeah. saying? That's, yeah. that's, the, that's the impact of our not being happy to have physical education. It, so we've got the transparency is important. And I know everyone took that to heart. And uh, we certainly do. Uh, we want our students to feel that they're to understand the value they're getting, which is we think is really good value, but it is complicated, right? And then this uh, model of combining everything may, uh, you, know, you might just get a, a bill for, if you can aggregate as the chancellors suggested and President Pines, you know, that might, and we compare that with uh, the value of the tuition, I think that would also, you know, make people feel, uh, under, feel, feel good and understand it. Anything else you wanna add? Well, I think we should take away two actions, Denise. One is, you know, a recommendation to add to the orientation programs a good explanation of the fees um, for every freshman class so that they can read the statements. Um, that's an excellent point. And then see if through ed policy, um, we can look at, or, or the finance committee, we can look at these fees against benchmarks from similar universities and uh, that was cute yeah I, I just have a comment i would just like to support the notion of combining uh, you know the fees is part of the tuition as the chancellor suggesting and even ada because you know i do think whether we're a student who's looking at those fees or whether we're going on an airline and getting nickel and dime to death anytime that happens to us as consumers our stress levels rise mm -hmm. and on behalf of Professor Josie's presentation this morning, maybe we can take a stressor out of an extra stressor out of the lives of our students by looking at more consolidation of fees so that they're better understood. Yeah, that's a great idea. And, and we'll be piloting it again this year. But uh, as of now, um, uh, my job is to uh, bring this issue to a vote. So we've had uh, the motion, the second. Um, if there's no other discussion, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Oh, any abstentions? Ayes have it. Thank you. Um, uh, next item, which is related, relates to uh, self-support fees, which are also fees that vary uh, significantly from 1% uh, to, uh, um, and I'll just make a motion that we um, uh, approve these fees uh, is there a second? Second. second. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 That's exactly right. Opposed, nay. Any, Any abstentions? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have two items here today. One will be an action item. The other one is a, an informational item. Uh, the informational item especially is um, well noted for this time because in one of our recent uh, committee meetings, uh, recent 
uh, Gil, Mike Gill, asked a question about uh, what are the benchmarks, what have we done, and have we done any kind of a studies or analysis to demonstrate the, the ongoing efforts in our various funds. So we'll have just a quick presentation of that so that everyone will understand this because we, at the end of this, will be asking these on action items to include an additional $6 million spread over three years. But the first item is really one of a, an informational item that is contained in the overall request. Uh, that is to start an earlier, earlier stage uh, fund that uh, encompasses an idea that I think that I have seen from a discussion that we had in our committee uh, from Salisbury. And I was very impressed with the students and former graduates and others who, as you hold what they talked about and what they were doing, uh, really involved a lot of ingenuity but a relatively small amount of money. And I, I, I thought that, well, given what they are in need of and what we're doing on a sort of a global level in terms of the <laughs> overall system, uh, we should have a program that will at least identify those kinds of initiatives and provide some level of support. And this is the earlier, earlier stage uh, fund for which we will identify those institutions. But that was simply my initial response to that. And we did not have the data, we did not have any kind of analysis to back that up. And so I asked that we do that in order for us to make a very informed decision today about what we want to do. So Ellen is gonna walk us through this briefly through some of the highlights, and then we will ask you to vote on an action item that will come after that Madam Chair. Ellen? Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. And I wanna start out by assuring you that I'm not gonna go through this whole deck that you already have. There is a lot of detailed information in the appendix that is well worth your time, but we'll go through the highlights. I also wanna start by saying, um, this is original work by Lindsay Ryan. So I'm speaking on behalf of Lindsay this morning. Um, as you know, Lindsay has carried on admirably with the economic development efforts at the system level, which is about collaboration and support for the university efforts. Uh, but this work she did in collaboration with all of her economic development colleagues across the system. So thank you to everybody. Um, so as Regent Leggett said, he directed us uh, to take a look at what was happening in earlier stage. And when we say earlier stage, for us, that means earlier than entrepreneurs, companies, and ideas that would qualify for momentum fund funding, which we're gonna talk about in a minute under another item. But we have specific investment criteria for the momentum fund, which requires um, for consideration, for a company to be considered for investment to be farther along than a lot of our earlier stage ideas or individuals are ready for. The other thing that Regent Leggett noted in economic development committee meetings was if you looked at where we were investing in the momentum fund, it's heavily, not totally, but heavily defined by the universities along the I-95 corridor. And so when we talk about diversifying our support, we're talking about diversity in every way, including geographic. I'll also add that the chancellor spurred us on with his visits to Frostburg, to <coughs> Salisbury, to UMES and said, look, there's great work going on at those universities and we need to do more at the system level to support and help lift that up. All of that resulted in Lindsay leading this study. And you can see on the only thing I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna highlight on this page, the number of people we talked to both inside the system and outside the system to get their thoughts and to get a picture of what was going on at the universities in these earlier stages. And interesting, and I'll give you the bottom line up front, um, two big recommendations. One was to be even more collaborative with our non-USM partners. This tends to be the regional economic folks, um, as well as local employers around the universities when we're thinking about entrepreneurial ideas because those ideas are aimed at improving economic and workforce development. 
And also in this one, um, I'm not sure we expected, which was to first leverage existing resources when possible, instead of creating new ones. And of course that led us to, well, what are the existing resources that are being used? I have to admit this surprised me. Um, four million dollars in either actual capital or other in-kind support it already exists within the university system at the university level that is supporting almost 100 ventures, 40% of which are student-led. Pause there for a minute, because I think that's new information for a lot of people. Um, and we list some of the sources of that. So the point we want to take away here in the work that was done is we already are significantly investing in many student, <coughs> faculty, and community ventures. Next slide. Then we wanted to understand, well, what is getting in the way? And you see these up here. Um, finances are certainly part of it, but as Regent Leggett intuited last September, it's actually just little bits of money that would be helpful at these early stages. What we identified were other barriers that we can work on. Things like not knowing what resources are available to utilize. Things like, I have a great idea coming out of the lab. I have no idea how to think about it from a business perspective. So who can we hook that person up with? And there are a myriad resources that will help think about business plans, think about commercialization, et cetera. Um, in many cases, um, and you'll, I think this is one of our agenda items later, it's the availability of the right kind of space to further the effort and the availability of free space for early, early <coughs> entrepreneurs. So figuring out how to broaden our ability to support folks who just need the information and need the matchmaking and connective tissue is important and figuring out for those entrepreneurs, whether those resources are resident already at their own university, whether there's someplace else they can go to get help, could start to mitigate some of the financial barriers. Next slide. So I'm not going to go into much more than this, but I'll give you, I would again urge you to read through the rest of it. We're working on three areas now, and we're working on a rubric for how to organize these information sources and also how to identify specifically what amounts of money in what way would be helpful. We are looking at non-dilutive capital. Um, so this would be more in the form of grants, small grants that the system would coordinate, but would administer the, the actual administration of the universities themselves. Um, where we go from here is we will, of course, continue to work with all the insti institutions to develop a more detailed proposal around the capital side of this and around the information shares, information sharing side of this. And we do intend to bring forward to the Economic Development Committee and the Finance Committee at a later time a pilot around small amounts of capital to employ against these issues. Um, so I'll pause there for the sake of time and see if there are any questions. Let me just say up front to the chancellor and the, the chair that I didn't go through this entire process, all of this study, just to put more money in the hands of the lady who want to make honey wine on the East Coast. That's just <laughs> <laughs> I, talk, I, I talked about that, but uh, but it is uh, it did it did fascinate me. Yeah. Any questions? From yeah, the any regions? questions? Yeah. Right on. All right. Yeah, Thank you. Over there. <laughs> um, most of the people I talk to in the business community, I, I'm an entrepreneur, obviously, many of us around this table. Number one issue is access to capital, which you have up here. Okay. And um, I think the second is that if they would like to seek out a mentor, uh, someone who's been down that road, who's made these mistakes. And um, I think how we can incorporate those two things into this would be really helpful. 
And last, I want to say that um, Bobby and I was up in Annapolis. There are so many tax credit programs up there that are not used, and they're historical. This this particular delegate or senator wanted this group to have this particular money. It just keeps getting funded every year. So we had this committee, and we looked at like 30 different tax credits, and we could only get rid of one because there's political support around all these others, but they weren't doing anything. Yeah. So, you know, that paradigm needs to be changed to bring the state with all these programs in, in line. And I noticed you mentioned some that are really positive up there, but th there's a lot of money there in different pots that I think if the system were to kind of help, help in certain areas, that that would be really useful. I, I couldn't agree more. I should also add that we've been working closely with the Commerce Department uh, and the staff there on this. But um, we hear the same thing no matter what stage the company's at. We are hearing that from companies that are getting momentum funding, momentum fund funding as well, which is um, the infrastructure in the state to support, especially the business side. And I know that sounds self-serving given what I do for a living, but we hear it all the time. You know, I need good financial people who know how to do startups and early stage companies. I need marketing and sales managers not ones that are coming out of big corporations, but ones who understand early stage companies. So we definitely see that the mentorship in the momentum fund. One of the things that Claire spends enormous amounts of time on is trying to mentor company founders and, and company CEOs, but it's a retail level effort. And yes, I think figuring out how to have a much broader mentorship program. And I know the Department of Commerce staff also works on this a lot. And there's the SBA program um, that, again, a lot of people don't even know exists in terms of free help with business plans, free helps with business coaching. So I would agree, I would put that under the, um, people don't know what they don't know and they don't know what's out there to help. So that is an area we can certainly get better at at the system level. Yeah, yeah. 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 Madam, oh, and then, Madam so, Chair, yeah, I just, uh, with respect to the greater facilities and equipment, I just, uh, I wonder, if you're looking at you know our our community colleges across the state and specifically i know at hagerstown community colleges there's a significant entrepreneurial business incubator facility there and so i would just say perhaps making sure we inventory those facilities i don't know how subscribed they are but if if it might enhance our relationships with the community great, colleges yeah. for matriculation great, purposes yeah. if we if we look yeah. at that so that's a great idea and i will say we haven't done that um what we hear proactively is a lot of um, maker space, wet lab space, other kinds of lab space. But um, the early stage companies also just need a little bit of space to be. Yeah. yeah. So for free, they don't have the money to pay rent. So, Secretary Deal. Yeah, Ellen, I'm just thinking out loud. Maybe um, <clears throat> Hugh was hitting on a little bit with the community college world. There's 33, 34 uh, incubators that are pretty well distributed. And maybe there's a way to kind of link up in a more formal way so that they have a, they have a strategy, they have a mission inside an incubator yeah. Yeah. to incorporate these cool ideas coming out of the universities. You know, and as you pointed out, for so many of them, it's all about the ecosystem of money, market, mentors, management and incubators could be a place where they could find some of those yeah and we have some of them within the system as well yeah. and i think the idea of like, networking like start, across like start up to you yeah it's i mean it's awesome yeah, yeah yeah it's a great idea good 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 well we'll go to the uh action item now which is the uh six million dollars spread over uh three years about two million dollars a year uh, for those who at least needed some additional information about how we have proceeded thus far. Uh, there's an item that we have here that outlines the number of jobs that have been created, how much additional monies that have been uh, invested into the companies uh, and what the long term objectives will be. Now, I will have to say that uh, we have not received this sort of hard major return on the monies, which was the initial intent. 
that as we invest and those companies become profitable, uh, we will then get our return back in extra dollars. I think it's probably been a little too early for that. Uh, but if nothing else, you look at the number of jobs that have been created, the number of additional companies, and all the other factors that we've looked at is very positive. And so we're taking a, an additional step, now an additional $6 million, uh, $2 million a year. And I'm reasonably certain that we will continue to see progress along the way, both in terms of jobs and the actual returns of monies back into the system, for which we would therefore reinvest and not have to come back as frequently to the system to ask for additional support. So with that, Madam Chair, I would- uh, One last one question. What account, or what, uh, what line item does that come under? What's the source of that capital infusion? Yes. Ellen? From our, <laughs> from the- from So the it's from, and I, I, I want the presidents to listen carefully. It's from the system fund balance. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> You, uh, in your wisdom, uh, when this was first set up, there was a $10 million set aside from the system fund balance as the initial corpus of investable funds. And that was and, in 2016. So yeah. And as Regent Leggett said, um, we benchmarked against similar university and system level funds like this um, in terms of um, when it would be reasonable to start expecting returns because you also <laughs> said, any returns we get from exits, mon you know, monetization events for the companies we invest in should go back into the fund and be reinvested so it can become evergreen. Um, and it's a little early yet um, in terms of when we made our first investment. Um, we think another two, maybe three years, and we'll start to see those companies that do succeed, and we all realize this is early stage investing, so we realize not everybody's going to be a winner, but um, that, that those that do um, have monetary exits, we'll start to see the money come back in. There is still a large need. We did um, some original work along with TEDCO and the Department of Commerce in trying to size um, the capital need in the state for this level company, uh, where the uh, early stage companies are, um, and then had a lot of internal discussions about what the appropriate role of the system is as part of the venture capital ecosystem in the state. Um, I will also tell you in the benchmarking, uh, we are the only ones using our own savings to fund this endeavor. And I know Regent Atman and Regent Leggett led us through a dis discussion that thought about alternative ways to fund this um, to grow it. But the short answer is it's the system's fund balance. Madam Chair, I move to approve. Second. Just two comments before we vote, Madam Chair. A, when we talked about the earlier, earlier stage uh, uh, fund and the comment made about those along the I-95 corridor, uh, we continue to fully support, will continue to support their efforts as well. It's just a need that was outside of that we thought needed to be addressed. So I want to make sure we're clear about that point. Uh, and secondly, uh, as we've said before, when we're asking for additional monies, we have done a great deal, at least the staff has done a great deal of research and analysis to come to this decision so it was not made in a hastily fashion. We put a lot of thought into it. Madam Chair, we're ready for the question again. It's been moved and second. Oh. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? The ayes have it. Thank you, Madam Chair. The, uh, the last item of the committee reports is for the committee of the whole, and uh, it's time for the affirmation of the UMBC president selection. As you know, UMBC's longstanding president, Dr. Freeman Rabowski, will retire following over 30 years of service to the University System of Maryland. Last fall, we began the process to select his successor. The UMBC President Search and Screening Committee was chaired by Regent Gordine. She was assisted by Vice Chancellor Tim Madonna and the Isaacson Miller Search Firm. A dynamic search committee of faculty, staff, students, alumni, and community members reviewed an impressive applicant pool and sent the board three very strong candidates. The board selected Dr. Valerie Shears Ashby to serve as the next president of UMBC. Dr. Ashby currently serves as the Dean of Trinity College, 
which is Duke University's largest <laughs> academic unit. She is an impressive scholar and a dynamic leader who is poised to build upon President Rabowski's legacy. Before I ask the board to affirm the selection of Dr. Aspey, I would like to invite Chancellor Perman to offer any additional insight he'd like to share. I uh, will not take the uh, board's time uh, because I, I think uh, it's been uh, demonstrated already before this formal action uh, how well we have all done uh, in attracting Dr. Ashby. And uh, as you can imagine, I've had many conversations with her. Uh, it was my privilege to do so in finalizing things. Uh, we all need to recognize that, uh, and, and Freeman has enough accolades, but I'm gonna say it anyway. We all need to recognize that when you lay the kind of foundation that he laid, that's how you get the Dr. Ashby's of the world to succeed. I move the board affirm its selection of Dr. Valerie Ashby as president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, my second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? I would like to thank Regent Bourdain for her leadership along with that of Vice Chancellor Madonna. Additionally, I would like to thank the members of the search committee for their outstanding work and the outstanding process they ran. Um, with that, we conclude the formal business. Madam Chair, can I, can I just say one more time? <laughs> yes. I have to say it just okay. because I am so thrilled. I think I'm happier today than I was when Don Langenberg appointed me. And I, I am, I'm so happy for my campus and for Valerie, for the institution, for the support you all give. And we appreciate it. Kathy Detloff was on that committee. That Kathy Stanton. Kathy is, is replaced Lynn Schaefer as our vice president for finance and administration, having been at Hopkins and Rutgers in Delaware. And so the university is in really good hands. So thank you all again very much. Thank you. Could you Chancellor starts with an event where he feeds us and you know, it makes us all feel good. We should know what's coming next <laughs> for future uh, for future reference. You know, it has been an incredibly busy season. We appreciate your time and value all of your thoughts. And so as we move uh, into closed session, I'm not stalling to sign the page. The consent agenda. I'm right. Sure. That's why the chancellor's here. The open <laughs> meeting that permits public bodies to close their meetings to the public in circumstances outlined in 3 305 of the Act and to carry out administrative functions exempted by 3 305. The Board of Regents will now vote for reconvening in closed session. The agenda for the public meeting today includes a written statement with a citation of the legal authority and reasons for closing the meeting and a list of the topics to be discussed. The statement has been approved, provided by the regents, and it is posted on the USF website. I will move that we close. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Any extensions or all right, hearing none, the public meeting is closed. We'll reconvene at noon in, uh, in closed session. Madam Chair, can you hear? No, next door. Next door. So, well, there's, um, if you go around the corner, there's a room for lunch, and the closed meeting is right next door. And we'll reconvene however you use that time, 12 to the closed session.